The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo. Book Ten, Chapter Three. Long Live Mirth. The reader has probably not forgotten that a part of the Cour de Miracles was enclosed by the ancient wall which surrounded the city, a goodly number of whose towers had begun, even at that epoch, to fall to ruin. One of these towers had been converted into a pleasure resort by the vagabonds. There was a drain shop in the underground story, and the rest in the upper stories. This was the most lively, and consequently the most hideous, point of the whole outcast den. It was a sort of monstrous hive, which buzzed there night and day. At night, when the remainder of the beggar horde slept, when there was no longer a window lighted in the dingy façades of the place, when not a cry was any longer to be heard proceeding from those innumerable families, those ant-hills of thieves, of wenches, and stolen or bastard children, the merry tower was still recognizable by the noise which it made, by the scarlet light which, flashing simultaneously from the air-holes, the windows, the fissures in the cracked walls, escaped, so to speak, from its very poor. The cellar, then, was the dram-shop. The descent to it was through a low door and by a staircase as steep as a classic Alexandrine. Over the door, by way of a sign, there hung a marvellous daub, representing new sons and dead chickens, with this pun below, aux seigneurs pour des trapassés, the ringers for the dead. One evening, when the curfew was sounding from all the belfries in Paris, the sergeants of the watch might have observed, had it been granted to them to enter the formidable court of miracles, that more tumult than usual was in progress in the vagabond's tavern, that more drinking was being done, and louder swearing. Outside in the place there were many groups conversing in low tones, as when some great plan is being formed, and here and there a knave crouching down engaged in sharpening a villainous iron blade on a paving stone. Meanwhile, in the tavern itself, wine and gaming offered such a powerful diversion to the ideas which occupied the vagabond's lair that evening, that it would have been difficult to divine from the remarks of the drinkers what was the matter in hand. They merely wore a gayer air than was their wont, and some weapon could be seen glittering between the legs of each of them, a sickle, an axe, a big two-edged sword, or the hook of an old hackbutt. The room, circular in form, was very spacious, but the tables were so thickly set, and the drinkers so numerous, that all that the tavern contained, men, women, benches, beer-jugs, all that were drinking, all that were sleeping, all that were playing, the well, the lame, seemed piled up pell-mell, with as much order and harmony as a heap of oyster-shells. There were a few tallow-dips lighted on the tables, but the real luminary of this tavern, that which played the part in this dram-shop of the chandelier of an opera-house, was the fire. This cellar was so damp that the fire was never allowed to go out, even in midsummer. An immense chimney with a sculptured mantle, all bristling with heavy iron andirons and cooking utensils, with one of those huge fires of mixed wood and peat, which at night, in the village streets, make the reflection of forge windows stand out so red on the opposite walls. A big dog, gravely seated in the ashes, was turning a spit loaded with meat before the coals. Great as was the confusion, after the first glance one could distinguish in that multitude three principal groups which thronged around three personages already known to the reader. One of these personages, fantastically accoutred in many an oriental rag, was Matthias Hungadi of Spicali, Duke of Egypt and Bohemia. The knave was seated on a table with his legs crossed, and in a loud voice was bestowing his knowledge of magic, both black and white, on many a gaping face which surrounded him. Another rabble pressed close around our old friend, the valiant King of Tunay, armed to the teeth, Clopin Trifot with a very serious air, and in a low voice, was regulating the distribution of an enormous cask of arms, which stood wide open in front of him, and from whence poured out in profusion axes, swords, bassinets, coats of mail, broadswords, lance-heads, arrows, and viratons, like apples and grapes from a horn of plenty. Everyone took something from the cask, 
one a morion, another a long straight sword, another a dagger with a cross-shaped hilt. The very children were arming themselves, and there were even cripples in bowls, who in armor and cuirass made their way between the legs of the drinkers like great beetles. Finally, a third audience, the most noisy, the most jovial, and the most numerous, encumbered benches and tables in the midst of which harangued and swore a flute-like voice, which escaped from beneath a heavy armor, complete from casque to spurs. The individual who had thus screwed a whole outfit upon his body was so hidden by his warlike accoutrements that nothing was to be seen of his person save an impertinent, red snub nose, a rosy mouth, and bold eyes. His belt was full of daggers and poniards, a huge sword on his hip, a rusted crossbow at his left, and a vast jug of wine in front of him, without reckoning on his right, a fat wench with her bosom uncovered. All mouths around him were laughing, cursing, and drinking. Add twenty secondary groups, the waiters, male and female, running with jugs on their heads, gamblers squatting over taws, morels, dice, vachettes, the ardent game of tringlet, quarrels in one corner, kisses in another, and the reader will have some idea of this whole picture, over which flickered the light of a great flaming fire, which made a thousand huge and grotesque shadows dance over the walls of the drinking-shop. As for the noise, it was like the inside of a bell at full peal. The dripping-pan, where crackled a rain of grease, filled with its continual sputtering the intervals of these thousand dialogues, which intermingled from one end of the apartment to the other. In the midst of this uproar, at the extremity of the tavern, on the bench inside the chimney, sat a philosopher meditating with his feet in the ashes and his eyes on the brands. It was Pierre Gringoire. "'Be quick! Make haste! Arm yourselves! We set out on the march in an hour!' said Clopin Trifot to his thieves. A wench was humming, "'Bonsoir, mon père et ma mère, l'audonnier corvent le feu. Two card-players were disputing. "'Knave!' cried the reddest face of the two, shaking his fist at the other. "'I'll mark you with the club. You can take the place of Mistigri in the pack of cards of Monsieur the King.' "'Ugh!' roared a Norman, recognizable by his nasal accent. "'We are packed in here like the saints of Caillovie.' "'My sons,' the Duke of Egypt was saying to his audience in a falsetto voice, "'sorceresses in France go to the witches' Sabbath without broomsticks, or grease, or steed, merely by means of some magic words. The witches of Italy always have a buck waiting for them at their door. All are bound to go out through the chimney. The voice of a young scamp, armed from head to foot, dominated the uproar. Hurrah! Hurrah! he was shouting. My first day in armor! Outcast! I am an outcast! Give me something to drink! My friends, my name is Jean Frollo du Malin, and I am a gentleman. My opinion is that, if God were a gendarme, he would turn robber. Brothers, we are about to set out on a fine expedition. Lay siege to the church, burst in the doors, drag out the beautiful girl, save her from the judges, save her from the priests, dismantle the cloister, burn the bishop in his palace. All this we will do in less time than it takes for a burgomaster to eat a spoonful of soup. Our cause is just. We will plunder Notre Dame, and that will be the end of it. We will hang Quasimodo. Do you know Quasimodo, ladies? Have you seen him make himself breathless on the big bell on a great Pentecost festival? Cone du Père, tis very fine. One would say he was a devil mounted on a man. Listen to me, my friends. I am a vagabond to the bottom of my heart. I am a member of the slang thief gang in my soul. I was born an independent thief. I have been rich, and I have devoured all my property. My mother wanted to make an officer of me, my father a subdeacon, my aunt a counsellor of inquests, my grandmother prothonotary to the king, my great-aunt a treasurer of the short robe, 
and I have made myself an outcast. I said this to my father, who spit his curse in my face, to my mother, who set to weeping and chattering, poor old lady, like yonder faggot on the andirons. Long live mirth! I am a real besetra. Waitress, my dear, more wine! I have still the wherewithal to pay. I want no more serene wine. It distresses my throat. I'd as leaf, corboof, gargle my throat with a basket. Meanwhile the rabble applauded with shouts of laughter, and seeing that the tumult was increasing around him, the scholar cried, "'Oh, what a fine noise! Populi de picantis populoso de picatio. Then he began to sing, his eyes swimming in ecstasy, in the tone of a canon intoning vespers, "'Coe cantica, coe organa, coe cantilenoe, Coe mele cloe hic sine fine decantantur, sonant mediflua hymnorum igona, suavissima angelorum melodia, cantica canticorum mira. He broke off. Tavern keeper of the devil, give me some supper! There was a moment of partial silence, during which the sharp voice of the Duke of Egypt rose, as he gave instructions to his bohemians. "'The weasel is called a drune, the fox bluefoot, or the racer of the woods, the wolf greyfoot, or goldfoot, the bear old man, or grandfather. The cap of a gnome confers invisibility, and causes one to behold invisible things. Every toad that is baptized must be clad in red or black velvet, a bell on its neck, a bell on its feet. The godfather holds its head, the godmother its hinder parts. Tis the demon Sidagrasum who has the power to make wenches dance stark naked. By the mass, interrupted Jehan, I should like to be the demon Sidragasum. Meanwhile, the vagabonds continue to arm themselves and whisper at the other end of the dram shop. That poor Esmeralda, said a bohemian, she is our sister. She must be taken away from there. Is she still at Notre Dame? went on a merchant with the appearance of a Jew. Yes, pardieu. Well, comrades, exclaimed the merchant, to Notre Dame. So much the better, since there are in the chapel of Saints Ferriol and Ferutheon two statues, the one of John the Baptist, the other of Saint Antoine, of solid gold weighing together seven marks of gold and fifteen estalan, and the pedestals are of silver gilt, of seventeen marks, five ounces. I know that. I am a goldsmith." Here they served Jehan with his supper. As he threw himself back on the bosom of the wench beside him, he exclaimed, "'By Saint Vaudeluc, whom people call Saint Gougalou, I am perfectly happy.' I have before me a fool who gazes at me with the smooth face of an archduke. Here is one on my left whose teeth are so long that they hide his chin. And then I am like the Marshal de Gué at the siege of Pantois. I have my right resting on a hillock. Ventre mes homme, comrade, you have the air of a merchant of tennis-balls, and you come and sit yourself beside me. I am a nobleman, my friend." Trade is incompatible with nobility. Get out of that. Hola, eh! You others, don't fight. What, Baptiste Croquasson, you who have such a fine nose, are going to risk it against the big fists of that lout? Fool! Non quicam datum est hibere nasum. Not everyone is favored with a nose. You are really divine, Jacqueline Rangeore. "'Tis a pity that you have no hair. "'Hola! My name is Jehan Frollo, and my brother is an archdeacon. "'May the devil fly off with him. "'All that I tell you is the truth. "'In turning vagabond I have gladly renounced the half of a house situated in Paradise, "'which my brother had promised me. "'Dimadium domum in paradiso. "'I quote the text.' I have a fief in the Rue Tirchapé, and all the women are in love with me, as true as saint Eloi was an excellent goldsmith, and that the five trades of the good city of Paris are the tanners, 
the towers, the makers of cross-belts, the purse-makers and the sweaters, and that Saint Laurent was burnt with eggshells. I swear to you, comrades, que je n'abauvre de piment devant un an si je se mant, that I will drink no spiced and hunting wine for a year if I am lying now. Tis the moonlight, my charmer. See yonder through the window how the wind is tearing the clouds to tatters. Even thus will I do to your gorget. Wenches, wipe the children's noses and snuff the candles. Christ and Mahome, what am I eating here, Jupiter? Away, innkeeper, the hair which is not on the heads of your hussies one finds in your omelettes. Old woman, I like bald omelettes. May the devil confound you! A fine hostelry of Beelzebub, where the hussies comb their heads with the forks. Ajene moi par la sang de ni foi ni wa ni feu ni lu ni wa ni du. And by the blood of God, I have neither faith nor law nor fire nor dwelling place nor king nor God. In the meantime, Clopin Trifot had finished the distribution of arms. He approached Gringoire, who appeared to be plunged in a profound reverie, with his feet on an andiron. "'Friend Pierre,' said the King of Tenay, "'what the devil are you thinking about?' Gringoire turned to him with a melancholy smile. "'I love the fire, my dear lord. Not for the trivial reason that fire warms the feet or cooks our soup, but because it has sparks. Sometimes I pass whole hours in watching the sparks. I discover a thousand things in those stars which are sprinkled over the black background of the hearth. Those stars are also worlds. "'Thunder, if I understand you,' said the outcast. "'Do you know what o'clock it is?' "'I do not know,' replied Gringoire. Clopin approached the Duke of Egypt. "'Comrade Matthias, the time we have chosen is not a good one. King Louis the Eleventh is said to be in Paris.' "'Another reason for snatching our sister from his claws,' replied the old Bohemian. "'You speak like a man, Matthias,' said the King of Tunay. "'Moreover, we will act promptly. No resistance is to be feared in the church. The cannons are hares, and we are in force. The people of the Parliament will be well balked tomorrow when they come to seek her. Guts of the Pope, I don't want them to hang the pretty girl.' Clopin quitted the dram-shop. Meanwhile, Shahan was shouting in a hoarse voice, "'I eat! I drink! I am drunk! I am Jupiter! Hey, Pierre, the slaughterer! If you look at me like that again, I'll fill up the dust off your nose for you!' Gringoire, torn from his meditations, began to watch the wild and noisy scene which surrounded him, muttering between his teeth, Luxurioso res vinum et tumultuoso eprietas. Alas, what good reason I have not to drink, and how excellently spoke Saint Benoit. Vinum apostatari facit itiam sapientes. At that moment, Clopin returned and shouted in a voice of thunder, Midnight! At this word, which produced the effect of the call to boot and saddle on a regiment at a halt, all the outcasts, men, women, children, rushed in a mass from the tavern, with great noise of arms and old iron implements. The moon was obscured. The Cour de Miracles was entirely dark. There was not a single light. One could make out there a throng of men and women conversing in low tones. They could be heard buzzing, and a gleam of all sorts of weapons was visible in the darkness. Clopin mounted a large stone. "'To your ranks, Argot!' he cried. "'Fall into line, Egypt! Form ranks, Galilee!' A movement began in the darkness. The immense multitude appeared to form in a column. After a few minutes the King of Tunay raised his voice once more. "'Now, silence to march through Paris! The pass where it is, little sword in pocket!' The torches will not be lighted till we reach Notre Dame. Forward, march! Ten minutes later, the cavaliers of the watch fled in terror before a long procession of black and silent men, which was descending towards the Pont au Change, 
through the tortuous streets which pierced the close-built neighborhood of the markets in every direction. End of Book 10, Chapter 3